Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Kennedy Report. It's a very special episode. I get to connect with my friend, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. We've tried to organize a show for months now, but uh, all of our responsibilities and deadlines have made that difficult. Dr. K writes about a book a week at this point, so he's pretty busy. Uh, Most of my audience will be aware of who Dr. K is, Dr. Kwasniewski. Uh, If they're not, just as a quick background, he is a renowned scholar in the realm of Catholic philosophy, theology, liturgical and sacred music, and so forth. And uh, he's written a number of books. But recently, he just released a book through Angelical Press called Bound by Truth, Authority, Obedience, Tradition, and the Common Good. I have just finished it. I've dog-eared. I've got tons of highlights in there. If people can see, it's a very good book. It, uh, it reads sort of like a manifesto, a traditionalist manifesto, which I think is very prescient in these times of great crisis that do intensify. But um, we'll talk about all the contents of that and various other things over this long-ranging interview. So, Dr. K, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Kennedy. It's a pleasure to be here. Did I miss anything pertinent in your biography? No. no. Okay. I I have a great interest in Catholic social teaching, too. That's right. That's right. Um, Good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into it today. We're going to go from root to fruit, from A to Z, traditionalism. What does that mean? Um, What is the Roman rite? We'll talk about obedience. We'll talk about all these things that are on everybody's mind. So make sure you bookmark this show. And if you do have any you know, conscientious Catholic friends or family who are recognizing that they're not really a fan of the rainbow blessings at their parish and whatever's coming out of fiducia supplicants, and they're looking for some way to understand it. Maybe they don't have a traditional chapel. Maybe they have the SSPX. Maybe they have to drive far. Share this interview with them because we're going to answer a lot of the questions, and I also welcome feedback. And I always say this at the end of the show, let me know what you think in the comments, but you can actually find my email um, under this show, I post it. It's a contact me form. You can fill that out. I get the emails. And if you have any other questions, we'll do our best to answer them. All right. I thought the first thing we would talk about before we get into Bound by Truth, let's define what a traditional Catholic is. Because um, for many, uh, traditional Catholicism is a, is a stereotype. You know, I mean, in the most egregious end of the spectrum, It's, you know, we're the backwardists, we're, you know, Cardinal Roche's enemies and whatever, and we just like smells and bells and lace and are crotchety and just can't get with the times. Or maybe we have a point, but we're kind of prideful and we should probably get with the the way that the church wants things to go. And then those of us who are traditionalists would say, no, 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 tradition is the deposit of faith. And it is fostered most perfectly and correctly in the traditional Latin Mass for the Latin Catholics, of course, in the East and different liturgies. So what is a traditional Catholic in your estimation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I think it's just helpful to point out that when you read the fathers of the church and the doctors of the church, you see in them a manifest devotion to the principle of tradition, meaning the normativity of what has been handed down from age to age. Uh, it norms us, it measures us. We receive it humbly and we pass it on gratefully. Um, what is tradition? Well, I mean, there's apostolic, there's dominical tradition, what Jesus Christ gave, but not th- not written down. There's apostolic tradition, um, There is, but there's also ecclesiastical tradition. And all of these types of tradition, even if they have different you know, levels of, of, um, of authority to them, they're all important. And there's never been a Catholic in the history of the church, I would say prior to the 20th century, who ever fundamentally questioned this idea that if we want to know how to worship, we look to our forefathers. If we want to know what to believe, we look to our ancestors. If we want to know the moral law, we ask, how did the saints in the past live and what did they practice, right? This idea of the idea of, in a sense, rethinking Catholicism for modern man and revamping it and recasting it and reinterpreting it and having these developments of doctrine that come out of nowhere, all the kind of stuff that we've been seeing in recent decades, this is completely foreign to the way that a Catholic thinks and acts and lives. And I, what I'm saying here is not just my opinion. It's based on the study of the church fathers and doctors on the basis of the past popes and councils um, and just on the basis of what you see when you study how the church lives from century to century. So it's really it's really unprecedented to have a kind of skepticism 
towards tradition in its totality. And to have this sense of we're going to pick and choose as if we're in a marketplace, you know, that pleases us. Oh, that displeases us. We like this, um, you know, we like this particular devotion, but we don't like fasting. That's too grim and difficult when we don't want that. No, that's, that's a, that is a Protestant mentality that has crept into the church and has seized for itself the name of Catholic this picking and choosing, this kind of cafeteria Catholicism. Um, and frankly, the traditional Catholic is simply saying, no, we don't want cafeteria Catholicism. We want all of it. Yes. And I will also add, you know, so often in these conversations, and heaven knows I've been involved with them in my defense of the Society of St. Pius X, we do delve. It's it's easy to get lost in the weeds of, I think you talk about it in Bound by Truth, um, you know, the sort of uh, hypothetical musings of scholastic manuals by authors who couldn't even conceive of a time so insane as this. Um, mm -hmm. it, reminds, it reminds me of, you know, the state of a contest uh, who will cite these hypothetical passages from Robert Bellarmine, uh, a man who didn't even believe that a situation like this could apply. So it truly was hypothetical. Um, but we kind of get away from the meat of the matter. And uh, as a traditional Catholic, I'm far from perfect. But I think that there's even... At, at the very root of when we discuss tradition, we're talking about a matter of virtue. We're talking about first principles of it is simply good and correct to want to do what those who before you did who were great. It's simply wrong and incorrect to not want to do that thing. Now, exactly. of, of course, there are certain ways of development and things like that. No one denies this. Um, we don't do the liturgy in the exact same way. You know, one of the... Um, one of the uh, common retorts I get about traditional mass, they'll say, well, you know, the, no the new mass kind of looks like um, uh, the way St. Justin Martyr described the liturgy. And <laughs> that's true, but he's one of many. And then, of course, it evolves in the good sense. It adapts, and we get what is canonized by St. Gregory the Great and is distilled over the ages and made more perfect. I want to read quickly here a quote that you put in Once in Future Roman Rite that I think encapsulates this, and you use this quote often, it's from St. Uh, Basil. And he says, For instance, I will mention the first and most common, who has learned through the scriptures that those who hope in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ are marked with the sign of the cross. What sort of scriptural text teaches us to turn to the East for prayer? Which saint has left us a scriptural account of the words of the Epiclesis at the manifestation of the bread of the Eucharist and the cup of blessing? We are not satisfied with the Eucharistic words that the Apostle or the Gospel mentions, but we add other words before and after theirs, since we have received non-scriptural teaching that these words have great power in regard to the mystery. We bless the water of baptism and the oil of chrism, in addition to the very one who is to be baptized. But what scripture? by what scriptures? Is it not by the secret and mystical tradition? But why? What scriptural authority teaches the anointing itself of oil? Where does a man being immersed three times come from? How much of the baptismal ritual is for the renunciation of Satan and his angels, and what scriptural text does it come from? Does it not come from this secret and unspoken teaching which our fathers guarded with a simple and unprying silence, since they were well taught that the solemnity of the mysteries is preserved by silence? Such matters must not be taken must not be seen by the uninitiated. And how is it appropriate that this teaching be published abroad in writing? So what he's saying here, and then you can comment on this, it's sort of, it's the same Protestant argument. Where is that in the Bible? And I always say, well, where is the Bible in the Bible? Where is the table of contents for the Bible in the Bible? We have this from the church. We have to trust that this is from our ancestors who knew, and we accept it. What say you to that? Yeah, well, I mean, what, what Basil is talking about is, is the unwritten tradition um, and uh, the, the, the best example to, to focus in on there, because it's such a topical example, is ad orientem worship. He mentions that. Why do we face East during the Eucharistic prayer? And let's, let's, let's just look at the evidence. The Christians were doing this for centuries before St. Basil wrote about it. And the only reason he wrote about it is because he was in a debate over the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's what, this that's what the treatise is, is for. And he's saying to the people who are denying the divinity of the Holy Spirit, look, you have, you have the same reason to accept the divinity of the Holy Spirit as you have to accept eastward worship. 
And why do you accept eastward worship? Because we've always done it that way. So you have this amazing moment where a father of the church is resting his case for the divinity of the third person of the Trinity mm -hmm. on eastward worship. Because, oh, of course we're going to do what our forefathers did, So, and we believe what our forefathers believed. So that's his basic argument. Um, you find a similar kind of argument in, in St. Cyril of Jerusalem, who later on, he says, he says, the reason you should believe that Jesus Christ is one person and not two persons, the way Nestorius does, is that if he were two persons and you received him in Holy Communion, he wouldn't divinize you. And so Cyril takes for granted that everyone thinks that the Eucharist is going to divinize you because it's Jesus Christ. You know, the real presence is taken for granted. Uh, take that, Protestants, right? Uh, and, and so then he's able to make a Christological argument based on everybody's acceptance of the real presence. So this is the kind of thing that you find in the Church Fathers left and right. They're, they're, they, be they bear witness to Catholic doctrines often in passing, as if to say, of course we all take this for granted because we've received it. It's not in the Bible, but we've all received it from the apostles um, and through all the bishops who succeeded them. Um, and that's just, you know, that, that's the way it goes. So it's in the fourth century that you start having, for the first time, detailed explanations of why Christians face eastward, which they had always been doing, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is the point. And the other thing you brought up that I think is important is this, right? That the church in the first few centuries was undergoing horrific persecution. So the church had to meet in people's homes. They didn't choose to go to people's homes and have a home mass. They had to be in people's homes. They had no churches to build. They, would, you know, they were being persecuted, right? But as soon as the Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity in the beginning of the fourth century, bam, the Christians started building basilicas. Constantine himself was building basilicas, big, beautiful, glorious churches covered with mosaics, right? And the liturgy emerged from the catacombs, so to speak. And suddenly, what did the church do? It began to elaborate the liturgy using incense and using vestments and using sacred music and all of the things that were sort of pent up, all this pent up energy from the catacombs just exploded. And why, why was that? Why was, why did that happen? Because the Christians knew that they had the most sublime sacrificial offering to give to God and to share with, with the faithful. And therefore nothing could be too good. Nothing could be too beautiful. Nothing could be too grand. And that's what, that's why you get development in the liturgy of the church, because people want to give God more and more of the best that they can. So the idea of suddenly saying, you know, in the 20th century, you know what, we don't want to, we don't want all this grand, beautiful, magnificent, awesome stuff anymore in the liturgy. We just want to go back to doing things the way the early Christians did during a period of persecution, right? Um, no, that, that's a completely, that's a bizarre way of thinking. Um, I wrote down a few notes there because there's a couple things I want to touch on. So you, I know, I know that you are a fan of Wolfgang Smith. You've cited him in mm. your works and I, I adore his work. Uh, for those who don't know, he's, he's a Catholic super genius. He has like a 1400 degrees and he had a master's by the time he was like 12 from Cornell. I mean, just, I'm, par I'm caricature, yeah, yeah. but it's not that far from the truth. And he writes on a lot of topics. And one of the things, because I am very... I mean, I understand Thomas as a universal doctor, but if we could pick like a, a sort of philosophical language that is easily understood based on our temperaments, I, I always go back to Augustine. And mm. uh, Wolfgang Smith is very Augustinian in his cosmology. And what he talks about, and he sort of distills the wisdom of the ancients as far as the different realms of existence. We have the eternal, the eternal, and the physical or corporeal realm that we mm. live in. The point of this is, is that God is eternal. He has no beginning and no end. Angels are eternal, spiritual bodies. They have a beginning, but they have no end. They're not bound by uh, space, but they do exist in time in some way. Um, we exist in space and time. And he uses this argument uh, to talk about why this has been lost, and there will be an actual end to history, an actual end to the world. This has to be understood. This has been lost. Nonetheless, what I've gathered from, from musing on some of his works, when we are trying to worship, what we are trying to do is we are trying, use the word divinize, we are trying to transcend those realms. God exists mm -hmm. by his own merit. He exists by his own existence. We can't be like him fully in the sense that we don't have a beginning. 
So when we worship, we are trying to enter into the Holy of Holies. We are trying to enter into a place where the eternal God with no beginning and no end is present there. So the liturgy itself, in order to be divine, to be a divine thing, which it is, it must correspond in some way to the nature of God. So when we look yes. at the, when we, there, is a, there is a providential reality to the fact that we don't have the, you know, this document was promulgated by John the Apostle to this church saying, follow these rubrics, do the, say the red, do the black. We don't actually have that because there is a way that we look at the liturgy and we say, in a sense, it has no beginning because it has no mm -hmm. end. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean, the way I would put it is like this. Um, the liturgy needs to imitate Jesus Christ. The liturgy is the presence of Christ to us in a certain sense. And he is both God and man. So as man, uh, the liturgy will be incarnate, embodied. It will appeal to our five senses, right? It will appeal to our note with our smell with incense, to our eyes with beautiful vestments and vessels and architecture, to our ears with with glorious sacred music, to our our touch when we feel the hard wood on our knees as we kneel, right, or whatever the case might be. So it the um, so the the liturgy is supposed to appeal to our senses, and therefore it needs to give us. Um, the most beauty, the most sensible beauty that man can muster. And in fact, this is exactly what we see when we look past back at the Byzantine and the Latin traditions, these magnificent works of art in every domain, right? That's because people challenge themselves to, you know, Deo Optimo Maximo, to God the greatest and best. That's what they challenge themselves. But Christ is also God. He is the transcendent, invisible God whom no man has seen or can see, as St. Paul says. You know, with with the mortal eye. So the liturgy should be transcendent as well. It should take our minds above earthly realities, outside of time and space, as you put it. Um, and how does it do that? Well, in the Latin liturgy, we have some wonderful ways in which that happens. Silence, right? Silence, these oceans of silence, like during the Roman canon, that puts us right to the edge of the ineffability of God, that you can't express him, that you can't put put into words this experience, this encounter with the ultimate mystery, right? We also have chant, chant which lifts us up from our earthly passions, unlike pop music, which appeals to our passions and stirs them up. But chant lifts us above our emotions and puts us into a sort of calm, peaceful, prayerful condition so that we can receive divine things, you know? Um, I mean, anyway, I could go on about this, but it seems to me that that the liturgy, oh, and, and most of all, this is my last point, the timelessness of the traditional Latin liturgy is something that a lot of people comment on. Like when, when I, certainly when I go to the Latin mass, to me, it doesn't feel like, you know, LARPing as some people say, like <laughs> as if I'm pretending to be like a crusader from the 13th century or, or something like that. No, it just feels timeless. It feels like you're entering into a sacred domain. You shut the doors behind you. You shut the world out for a short time to give yourself completely to God. And, you know, the liturgy begins and it just has this sense of like, it's always been going on and it's always going to be going on. And in that sense, it gives you a taste of the liturgy, the heavenly liturgy in the, the new Jerusalem, right? That we read about in the book of Revelation, right? Where the, the lamb once slain is being adored by, by all the angels and saints in heaven. That's what liturgy should do for us. Uh, and, and that's very much what the Latin mass does. Yes, I'm going to uh, build on that. So when, again... If we think about the the mass is it is it is it is Christ in a sense. I mean, obviously Christ is the victim, but there's a reality where when we interact with the mass, with the priest, with the sacraments, we are acting we we are interacting with Christ Himself. So when I think about the scriptures, um, in the beginning of Christ's life, things are on earth, things are a little bit obscure. There's not a lot of history about those early years. And then over time, more of his majesty is revealed to us until the point when we read in the Gospels that his ministry on earth is perfected and it's realized in its fullness with the crucifixion, the resurrection, and so on and so forth. The liturgy is the same. There is this period in the early church where some things are mysterious, where we do, and I don't mean this in a, in a derogatory sense, but we do see liturgies in these fragments and manuscripts and things that are in a sense kind of infantile, meaning they haven't matured yet, but then they get to the point mm -hmm. where they're fully grown. 
the 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 great exactly. error the great error in the false antiquarianism the sort of modernist heresy that Pius X and Pius XII both spoke about in their great encyclicals is this false antiquarianism where we go back to the past and we look for something as validation to do something now but not with the right intention we're not saying oh let's uh look into some old books and manuals to perfect what we know we're still supposed to do it's Let's go back there and look for something that's inappropriate for the true progression of the maturity of the church and do yes. that now. Yes. What, do you th what would you say to that? Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly the case. And, and I'll tell you a brilliant example of that, probably the best example because it's so easy to grasp, is that of communion, the manner of receiving yeah. Holy Communion. You know, um, yes, there is some evidence in the early church, by the way, not a lot of evidence, but there is evidence that communion was received in the hand. However, there's a reason why pretty soon after that, the custom of receiving in the hand disappeared. Why did it disappear? Because people came up with a better and more reverent way of receiving Holy Communion, a way that was more expressive of their adoration of the Lord, a way that was more careful and more safe as far as the distribution of the Holy Gifts. And so the, that's a good example where you see the church, because the church always had faith in the real presence, over time, the pastors of the church were able to move the manner of giving communion and receiving it in, into a better direction. It's a maturation process, just as you said, so that by the end of the first millennium, no one anywhere in the world, East or West, is receiving communion in the hand, no one. And then for a thousand years after that, actually more than a thousand years, people are all receiving directly into the mouth, right? Whether they're kneeling as in the West or standing as in the East, they're still receiving from the priest into the mouth. But then when you have in the 1960s, basically a bunch of progressive clergy and theologians, they want to revive communion in the hand. They say they want to revive an ancient custom, but in fact, they revived it in a different way that never corresponded to anything that was done in ancient times. So they actually invented a, a new way of receiving communion that doesn't correspond to the patristic evidence. And moreover, they did it because they basically had a Calvinistic view of the real presence, namely that all of us are the body of Christ. And, you know, we, we are all the real presence together and we're all together in this meal. And so we need to partake of the meal together. And once you start thinking that way, you're going to get to people handling the food because you have basically a meal concept, not a sacrifice and, and not a, not a not and not the real presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament as your focal point. So I think that, that that's a great example where the false antiquarianism comes in really as an excuse, as a kind of Trojan horse for a Calvinistic Eucharistic theology. Um, and, I've, and I've proved this in other writings, so I'm, I'm not just making this up off the top of my head. Yeah, and there's that famous quote, I can never pronounce the theologian's name. He was a uh a Calvinist theologian after the new mass was released. There's like four X's in it and a silent Q. Some of these. Oh, Skillabex. It's not Skillabex. He wasn't Skillabex. Catholic. He was. He was. Oh. Cath he was. He was Calvinist. Um, oh, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, some strange name. It's anyway. It's one of those famous quotes. I I did a talk from my parish uh, in 2022 in the summer. It was never released, but I, I think it was called something like. Uh, is the new mass Catholic or something like that? And I quoted the receptions of these Protestant theologians to the new mass, and the one Calvinist theologian was very clear that wonderful. We now have a mass. We now have a service we can accept. And uh, I don't know. That's just horrifying. Um, yes. Yes. So, <clears throat> all right. One of the major questions that people always ask is, okay, I understand reverence for tradition. I, I understand. Yes, it's nice to do the nice things. I'm okay with that. But why would we keep using Latin? Why would we keep using this language that nobody understands? And I'm going to give my background on that because the one thing I do have some scholarly background in is, is languages. That was my area of study in university. I want to just touch quickly, ladies and gentlemen, people have this impression that uh, until, I don't know, 1500, 500 years ago or something, Europeans and others were walking around speaking ecclesial Latin in their conversations. This is just simply not true. The Latin that we use in the liturgy, um, I'm going to estimate here, I don't think there was probably more than 10 to 15% of people in all the Roman Empire who could converse in that Latin effortlessly. What you have when you have languages, there was a Latin for sure, but I speak Italian, I speak Spanish, I speak French. These are essentially dialects of vulgar Latin. You have this lingua franca, you have this mother tongue, and this is something that's used as a standard language 
in the world of affairs, in the world of academia and literature and so forth. And essentially, it's just for the educated people. And then you have what are these dialects of these languages, which can be a mix of sort of tribal local languages. Hence why on paper, French looks very similar in some ways to Italian, but it sounds very different. Hence why uh, Spanish, as close as it sounds in many ways to Italian, has a lot of Arab influence with certain words, like the word hola actually comes from a word for ojala, which is an Arab word, which basically means praise be to God or something, but it's a greeting um, in any event. So first and foremost, Latin was never the language that people would just chit chat about at the local tavern or pub in the way that we understand it. But perhaps you give a little a better background about why we have Latin and why we should keep it. Yes. No, I mean, you're quite right about that. So this is how I would put it. Um, in the ancient world, uh, around the third and fourth, let's say third century is what the latest is, is what the best research indicates. Um, you would have people speaking vulgar Latin. There was definitely a popular Latin, but then there was also the, the, the Latin of educated people, of poets, of rhetoricians, of philosophers, of Cicero, for example, someone like that. Um, although he came much earlier, but I'm just pointing out that right. you know, the kind of Latin we're talking about. And when the reason that the liturgy in the Church of Rome was not initially done in Latin, but in Greek at the very beginning, um, as all of the, er the, the earliest liturgies were done in Greek, um, is because Greek already had a very mature poetic and rhetorical register, thanks to the Septuagint and thanks to so much um, theological speculation that had been done in Greek. But Latin was not a Christian language yet. It hadn't been Christianized. It hadn't been baptized, so to speak. So what had to happen is a couple of centuries of Christians working very hard in Latin to bring it up to snuff for the sake of, of both theology, writing, and liturgy. You see somebody like Tertullian is a great example where he really pioneered Latin as a theological language. And so when the liturgy is put into Latin, it's not because they want to put the liturgy into the vernacular tongue. It's that Latin has finally developed a high enough register of, of Christian uh, you know, rhetoric that it's possible to put the liturgy in, a, in an appropriate register of language you know so that is something that's high and noble and artistic because the ancients moderns have such strange ideas yeah M moderns want to make everything accessible to everybody instantly in the ancient world they understood better that when you're dealing with worship when you're coming humbly before god you need to even speak to him in a very formal and elaborate way. You you don't just say, "Hey God, how you doing, bud?" You know, like you don't. This is the way that you know. Sometimes you find people. You know, they want to make like the baseball Jesus or whatever. And everything is just super casual. No, that's not the way that any sane person would think about the eternal and infinite God if they had any kind of clue what they were talking about. So the the I'm sorry if I'm going on too much. No, here, this is good. The, the Latin language, the Roman liturgy, <clears throat> is a highly refined and uh, stylized language that would have been difficult for the man on the street to grasp. But you know what? The early church didn't care because the liturgy was being directed to God, not to the man on the street. Okay. And that remains the case this day. Liturgy is worship of God, not parleying with man or, you know, a chit chat or a Bible study with man. That's not what liturgy is. It's the worship of God. And we have the privilege of joining in. We can sort of grab onto the coattails so to speak, of the liturgy, and we can be lifted up to God with it. So the thing about Latin is it's, it, you see this in all of the different uh, Christian rites um, as they developed over the centuries. They all end up using, no matter what language they start with, they hold on to that language, they use a high register of it, and it ends up becoming what's called a reserved or a sacred or a hieratic language. Um, so you see this with you know, with the Coptics, they use an archaic form of language called Gaez. Uh, the Greek Orthodox use Koine Greek, which is no longer spoken. The Russian Orthodox use Church Slavonic. The the Anglicans, you can even use that that example. Although they start they started with Elizabethan English, which is a pretty high and noble register even in its own day. Um, the, the Anglicans didn't give that up. They just held on to it in spite of how English changed subsequently. So there's this sense that the language of the liturgy should be special high, poetic, rhetorical, stylized, appropriate for this awesome moment. Um, and see, th this is what we have with Latin. Latin is the language of worship in the Western church, 
has been since the beginning, since since the, the earliest centuries, the third century, as I mentioned, is when it began to go into Latin. And no one questioned that after that point. No one questioned it. Why? Because it was fitting, because it was dignified, because it gave a universal language for every, every for the clergy everywhere throughout Europe, no matter how many local dialects there were, everybody could read theological texts and everybody could read the Missal and sing the Gregorian chant and so on in one language. And you know what? We need that now just as much as the medievals needed it because we are living in a multilingual, multicultural world and we need that one unifying sacred language more than ever. What's well, interesting, you mentioned multilingual, multicultural. I used to live in Italy. Uh, my mother's an immigrant from there and um, I spent some time in elementary school there. And... Um, there are still dialects. I was lucky. My my no 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 not God rest their souls. They were from not Florence, but about forty minutes from Florence in a city called Lucca, and they naturally spoke what was called the Fiorentine dialect, uh, which did end up becoming standard Italian um, after the revolutionaries sort of standardized the language for the rest of Italy for public education and things like that. Nonetheless, in Italy today, still today, as in all these places, you'll go around to different places and they call them dialects and then in a sense they are but sometimes they're almost incomprehensible different languages and mm -hmm. that's after all of this public education that's after all of this standardization back then people had these dialects so the same needs and you know the modernists love to talk about the needs of modern man and i want to talk about what modern man is in a second they'll talk about the needs of modern man well from this perspective our needs as far as modern men, are actually the exact same as so-called ancient men because they might have arguably had more dialects than we do. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they did in some cases. They couldn't read or write in most cases, so they didn't have the standardized languages shoved down their throat in their public schools. Um, so it was necessary for them for the same reasons it's necessary for us now. And that's something people should understand. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me just mention sure. briefly that... Uh, just an experience I had, which is such a great example of what we're talking about. I visited a fraternity of St. Peter Parish in Vancouver uh, some years ago, and I went to Mass. I mean, I, as I go to Mass wherever I am, if I can find the Latin Mass, and, uh, and I was so moved uh, to, to discover how multi-ethnic this congregation was at the Latin Mass. There were, there were Africans. There were Asians, multiple. I mean, I, there were Koreans and Vietnamese. Um, I think some Filipinos were there. There were, of course, there were some white people from from Vancouver. There were Hispanics. There were there were there were so many different races and nationalities. You almost never see that at the Novus Ordo, and why? Because the Novus Ordo, in a manner that I would actually describe as implicitly racist. Yes. It, sep it separates people according to their ethnicities. So if you speak Spanish, there's the Spanish mass for you. If you speak Vietnamese, there's the Vietnamese mass for you. It sounds like an act of kindness. And in a certain sense, I admit, it's nice to hear a sermon in your own language, you know, and that's, that's something that, you know, there have to be solutions to how do you educate people in their own language? Fine. But the effect of it is that it it separates these ethnicities and these languages into different groups that never mingle with each other. That is not Catholic. That's never been the way the Catholic Church has been. Well, let's just say we it's not good when you have simple linguistic or ethnic divisions in the church. That typically doesn't end well. Um, and it's a really yeah. good idea to have a liturgy that at least counteracts or counterbalances that tendency, right? That tendency of fallen human beings to to, to withdraw from the Catholic totality into their little enclaves, right? And just to have their own way of doing things, it, it's, you know, something can go really wrong with that. And you see this among the Eastern Orthodox as well, where, where there's a kind of ethno-nationalism yes. that becomes confused with and conflated with, um, with religion and with the church, right? Yeah, and even, and even this, so... We're dealing with a unique problem in the, let's call it, I hate this word modern, which we'll talk about in a sec. I hate this, uh, or sorry, we see this uh, diaspora from all of these places after the revolutions in Europe. Okay, fine. So we have this unique problem. Yes, you know, my family on my mother's side comes from Italy. My family on my father's side comes from England. I need to look into their history because I'm reading through St. Edmund Campion's biography right now by Evelyn Waugh. 
And I want to know who the martyrs were in my dad's side of the family because they did keep the faith and they were English. So I don't know how they did that. Uh, that's pretty heroic. Yeah. And any of, none of them practice yeah. anymore, sadly. Um, but in any event, yes, there's this unique problem. But this problem was dealt with on the ground very prudentially by the bishops yes. of the various dioceses. So Charles Coulomb, who I know you, you know and love as well, he talks about how being French-Canadian uh, on the East Coast where he'd grown up as a young boy, they did have a French Canadian parish. It was it wasn't officially so like you know everyone had to go there, but the bishop <clears throat> knew that there was this population of French Canadians in northeastern United States um, that they wanted to have a priest who could preach them in French, and that's fine. That makes total mm -hmm. sense. They had the Irish parish. You go to Chicago, which you and I will be yes. there soon for the Mass of Ages premiere for the third episode of the series, and they have the Polish parish, but it's still the same liturgy, it's still the same right. faith. And it integrates naturally. Exactly, and and yeah, no, that's exactly right. Um, by the way, there's a there's a parish in um, Ottawa called Saint Anne's. Uh, no, Saint Clement. I yes, think FSSP called. there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, where the, the the they preach in French and English. Yes, at the masses, it's just a short homily first in French, then in English. And it's, and it's actually, I was talking to the priest there once, and he said, well, initially we would preach the same thing, but enough people can understand both that they said, this is kind of boring. So then, so now they have a different homily in, in, in each of those languages so that everybody gets something, right? Um, but, but the point I want to make is, is yes, even though there were Irish parishes, German parishes, Polish parishes, Czech parishes, every, all these different nationalities, nevertheless, if those people had to go somewhere else for mass, they could seamlessly integrate into another church and, and and visit it because the liturgy was always the same. And I had this wonderful experience myself just a few years ago when I went to Poland, I was in Krakow. Uh, and of course, I mean, it's sad because with a name like Krasniewski, I mean, it's as Polish as Kielbasa, you know, I should be able to speak Polish fluently, but I, I, I don't, I speak three or four words in Polish um, because it wasn't spoken in my family growing up. And, uh, and I don't have 10 years to learn Polish as it probably would take to do. <laughs> but anyway, so I was in Krakow and uh, I felt like I was just swimming in an ocean of unintelligibility. I mean, I couldn't make any sense out of anything because it's so different from, from the other languages that I'm familiar with, the Romance languages. But then I went to a Latin mass and it was like, it was like entering into this like wonderful warm bath of consolation because suddenly it was like intro Ibo ad altari day, you yeah. know, and just every, the whole thing was totally familiar and it, it reminded me of this german book i saw once called um oh, i don't remember the title in german but it was but the translation of it was uh everywhere in the world we are at home everywhere we are at home right and that's that's the feeling that that traditional catholics have wherever they go it doesn't matter what country i've been to i've been to many countries it's always the same liturgy and the people the catholics who go to this liturgy are they are motivated by the same traditional principles of the faith that I am. So we have an instant connection. Mm -hmm. You know, I have more connection to to a random traditional Catholic in Australia uh, than I do with a lot of mainstream Catholics who might live down the street. Right? It's because we we are being nourished by these same ancient sources. Right? And they give us the same ideals, the same aspirations. You know, my wife and I talk about this. Um... We were, uh, actually, quick anecdote. I lived in Ottawa for almost three years during university, and I lived two or three blocks from St. Clement's, and at the time, the SSPX had a chapel on the same street or down the road. Um, I think it was called Holy Angels or something. Anyway, I was an idiot at the time, and I wasn't a practicing Catholic. So to my great shame, for three years, I was in, uh, in between two traditional Catholic parishes, and I didn't go to either one of them, and I'll regret that till the day uh. that I die. Uh, but one time I did still, I was, you know, I was baptized Catholic. I had this conscience that I was wrestling with, you know, but I was in university, so I was so smart and I knew everything and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I kind of let my, 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 my baptismal grace get the better of me one day. And I said, I'm going to go to mass. So I looked up, um, you know, Catholic parish near me. I'd never been to Latin mass in my life. And I stumbled in on, on the fraternity of St. Peter for mass. And I was such a moron, Dr. K, I, 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 I must, I must regret it. I thought I was somewhere like Ukrainian or something. There was all these ladies and these, um, you know, their veils and things like that. And I said, man, I'm at some sort of ethnic parish. And I was literally just at the Fraternity of St. Peter. But I remember the homily being in both languages. I speak French, so I listen, and it was the same in both. Um, but in any event, I wanted to um, 
touch just quickly on this idea of modern because mm -hmm. I can't stand this. Actually, I was listening to Dr. or I don't know if it's Dr. but Robert Moynihan. Uh, he was with Matt Gaspers. They did a show. Matt told me to listen to it, so I did. It was a good show. And um, and Moynihan was making the comment, and it's interesting to watch him because he's kind of he's kind of been becoming more traditional on air. <laughs> you know, he's very much a, a Ratzingerian JP2 kind of guy, and he's very reluctant. And then he dropped a bomb on his show, and he said he talked to a Senegalese cardinal years ago who has since passed, and he told him, he said, Robert, one day Archbishop Lefebvre will be canonized a saint. And, and, and I was like, that was very astonishing coming from Dr. or from Robert Moynihan because he mm -hmm. hasn't, hasn't been so, so um, affectionate towards Lefebvre. But the point being is um, Moynihan was talking about how um, basically as the more that he understands tradition, the more that he understands the necessity uh, of finding these practices that have been around forever uh, because the universal chaos that continues to to happen as a result of this has caused many more problems. And he was referencing Sacrosanctum Concilium, and he talks about this this uh, desire to have the modern stuff for the modern man. And he says, "But this is ridiculous because we, everyone's calling themselves postmodern now. So modern yeah. being modern is already out of date." So, from, as a philosopher, as a philosopher, you can comment on this. I find even just the term modern. I know we use it colloquially because that's just a descriptor. But inherent in this idea of being a modern man versus a medieval man versus a whatever man is this idea that human nature fundamentally changes. So even this idea mm -hmm. that a modern man would need something different than a non-modern man, I think it's I think it's a corrupted way of thinking even at the at the outset. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I mean, Father Richard Chipola from from Connecticut. Uh, I remember he said to me once, you know, the Second Vatican Council was called in order to preach the gospel to modern man right when modernism and rationalism were about to die and when post-modernity and the explosion of relativism and pluralism and you know basically intellectual anarchy was just about was just about to go off right uh, and so that that's part of the reason i think that vatican ii reads as such a dated council right now i mean even apart from whatever problematic texts there are in it just as a literature as a piece of literature it it feels very very dated yeah. um, and the reason that that's true is that it's addressing a world that was sort of hot stuff when the bishops at the council were young so they were sort of remembering the earlier 20th century and and maybe between world war one and world war two or maybe they were thinking about certain aspects of the 1950s whatever they were thinking of it was very much a council that was dealing with past business that was about to become quickly totally irrelevant, um, at least from a cultural point of view. I'm not saying from a theological point of view, everything they said was irrelevant, but but um, <laughs> what, what, they, what they didn't realize, but what some sociologists and anthropologists and psychiatrists and others were realizing at the time of the Second Vatican Council and even long before is that modern people to the extent that you just use it as a chronological descriptor, people who are living in this age, right? They are, they suffer a great deal from disorientation, alienation, deracination, because they don't have any kind of meaningful connection anymore with the past. Mm -hmm. they've, they've been sold a false bill of goods by rationalism, which is that you can create yourself ex nihilo, according to your own ideas and desires. So they're cut off from the past. They're cut off from other people because of individualism. They're cut off from any kind of hierarchy of goods by liberalism. You know, they're basically modern men are like, they're like atoms in a void or like corks floating on the ocean. And what would have been necessary to address that kind of, of psychological situation is for a, a strong reaffirmation of tradition, of identity, of orthodoxy, right? Of dogma, of, you know, like all of the things that the schemas that were prepared, well, not all, they didn't do this perfectly, but the schemas that were prepared for Vatican II uh, were actually addressing real issues of modernity, right? And then, as you know, they just got swept away by the by the Northern and Central European liberals at the beginning of the council. And then it was like a tabula rasa from that point onwards. We have to, you know, we have to build a better, uh, boat, you know, it was the whole mentality. So yeah, I basically, I, I think that this is part of the reason why you cannot, you cannot convince a young person nowadays, or really anybody under about 40, to take any interest in Vatican II. I, <laughs> I mean, know, it's, yeah, it, it's great. 
the, the only way that they become interested is if they have to be for professional reasons. Yeah. You know, they work for the U.S. bishops or they work for a, a religion department and they're required to teach it as part of the curriculum. But it doesn't generate any enthusiasm or even any resonance because we are somewhere fundamentally different from where the world was in the early 60s. Right. It's funny you mentioned. But, sorry. But, oh, sorry. Go on. Well, let me just add. But but when I say we're in a different place, I still I still agree with you 100 percent that man's nature never changes. So what man needs in every era is to be saved from his sins. He needs to be taught the truth that's that that, um, you know, that that will elevate his life and lead him to heaven. You know, he needs to be taught about what the virtues and the vices are. He needs to order his life to to the contemplation and love of God. And all of these things never, ever change. I mean, our circumstances change, usually for the worse, it seems to me, in recent times. So it's harder for us to do these things, maybe, or to learn about them. But what we need to learn and what we need to do is exactly the same. And that's why we can take up, and people still do take up, the Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, yeah. or the Sermons of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, or St. Augustine's Confessions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Well, it's funny. So two things. I was just reading. Um, uh, I have that Blessed Be God prayer book, which I really love that book. Yeah. And and I, and it has um, many of the selections of the imitation of Christ in the uh, in the back of the book. And I, so I read that in the morning after morning morning prayers. And this is written 400 years ago, roughly, whenever it's written. And I'm a modern man and I work on the Internet and I, you know, deal in the public eye. And but I'm reading this timeless wisdom about uh, the danger of curiosity about what other people are doing, uh, the tongues of detractors and so on and so forth. And immediately mm. in my mind, I, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm like, okay, it's my YouTube comments. It's the critics on blogs and things like that. None of these things existed at the time of Thomas A. Kempis, but the problem was the same. People had detractors. People were worried about, it didn't matter if they had social media or not. There was this thing called gossip and it's still around. And But it's just, as you yeah. say, he didn't have any era of civilization in mind. He just had timeless wisdom in mind. And that speaks to me now as much as anything that anyone now could write to me. You could just insert social media instead of something else. But it's the same wisdom. And yes, um, yes. so, but funny, you mentioned under the age of 40. So I'm, th I'm not 36 yet. I'll be 36 in, I don't know, 20 days, I guess. Funny enough, sorry for the side notes. But so my middle name is Joseph and I was born on the vigil of St. Joseph. And mm. I never even thought of that in a, for my whole life. We weren't practicing growing up. And then when I went to write my first book, Terror of Demons, Modeling After St. Joseph, it was like this flooding of an aha moment where I realized, oh, St. Joseph, you were there the whole time. You're literally in my name and I was born on the vigil of your feast day. Why was I so dumb? I didn't realize this whole time. But so I've tried to pick up I mean, I haven't read every single word of Vatican II. I don't think all the bishops at the council read every single word of Vatican II. Um, but I'm, I, tr I try to read it, and I just sit there and I go, first of all, I'm, con I'm kind of confused. <laughs> Second of all, um, it just it reads like something that if you were really into the new theology and you kind of had this distillation of the Greek fathers and modern philosophy, and you kind of blended those together, and that was your shtick, you were a personalist or something, this would make sense to you. But I'm looking at it as someone who's a very meat and potatoes Catholic, and I'm going, I just, this doesn't speak to me at all. Whereas, there's some nice passages, of course, but whereas when I read the Council of Trent, which is much older, or I read something from the Fourth Lateran or something like that, it's just, ah, this is perfectly clear. This makes perfect sense to me, yes. and there's no way around yes. it. And I was speaking to a traditional priest um, in, the, in the States, a society priest, and I was asking him, you know, aside from any divine miracle or some crazy conversion event or something like that, but when, when Father, do you think that the crisis in the church will end, just pragmatically? And he said, well, you know, I don't have any insight, but he said, he said I think just naturally— it's going to go away in a sense in 40 to 50 years because he said, I get messages from all these young priests all the time, these Novus Ordo priests who found tradition and so forth. And he says, they just don't care about Vatican II. You know, they, they're just basically waiting for their bishops to stop having them read it. And then eventually they just want to go back to the old stuff. Maybe you found something similar. Yes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, it's not what you're saying is not surprising because, uh, first of all, you know, there's a great saying that God so loved the world that he did not send a committee. <laughs> right? And uh, and so 
committee documents by their very nature tend to be unwieldy, ten, you know, tendentious, uh, maybe not tendentious, but un- unwieldy, rather boring, rather fat, you know, a lot of padding, a lot of compromised language, right? This is, this is why like when government, when, when the U S government, uh, brings out a spending bill, it's always like 2000 pages long. Okay. Yeah. So this is the, the problem with Vatican two is their aim was unclear from the first moment. And That's all you right. have to do is go back to John the 23rd's uh, opening speech on October 11th, 1962. And he says, we are not calling a council because there are any errors or heresies in the church, <laughs> which is always, I always found that amusing. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're not calling a council to condemn any errors. We're not going to condemn anything. No, we're just calling a council because we want to talk about the gospel to modern man, basically, yeah, yeah. Is, is what's said. Well, that is so open-ended and vague. What are you going to get out of that exactly? Um, whereas with all the earlier councils, right, they met for a particular reason, right? Let us meet to talk about Arianism. Let's meet to talk about, you know, Pelagianism. Let's meet to talk about pro- the Protestant revolt, okay? And then, and now we've got an agenda. The agenda is re restating as clearly and succinctly as possible the catholic truth and then stating as clearly and succinctly as possible the errors to be condemned <laughs> and then boom that's what you get de fide de fide de fide anathema sit anathema sit anathema sit right so that's that's a, that's a council that's not going to waste words and it's one that's very actionable in the sense that afterwards you know just what you're supposed to do you know just what you're supposed to believe and just what you're not supposed to believe but reject uh, and then something like the Council of Trent gives very concrete recommendations for here's what the bishops need to do to reform the church in their in their region. They have to first of all they have to live in their region because the bishops were a wall back then. They were living all over the place. No, you have to live in your diocese. You need to start a seminary and train people. You need to uh, remove abuses from the mass, and it's just boom, boom, boom. Right? It's a real plan of action. There is nothing like that that I just described in Vatican II. No wonder why 60 years later we're still arguing about it. They're still scratching our heads trying to figure out what to do with this albatross. You know? Yeah. Have you ever read this book, I Accused the Council by Archbishop Lefebvre? Yes, yes, it's good. Well, I mean, this is the funny thing. Uh, Tim Flanders, um, a mutual friend of ours, he always loves to say he calls him like the patron saint of being a moderate. And, uh, you know, Lefebvre is regarded as this arch traditionalist. But the funny thing is, there's nothing wrong with being an arch traditionalist, but to to, to sort of buck the stereotype, you read in this book and he presents as part of this international group of fathers, the Chetus Internalis Patrum, he presents the the, the solution, which seems very reasonable. He says, okay, you want to do your like high minded, highbrow, pie in the sky philosophical musings that you think will inspire people. Fair enough. Let's also release a companion document to each release document that says, this is what this exactly means. And here are the points of doctrine, blah, 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 blah. And they rejected. And he said, I have no problem with the idea that you could try to use the language of the time because there is a utility in that, but we need to give the clarity. And this will bring me to a quote right here from your, um, uh, I'm going to read this quote from your book and then i also want to reference a recent article on your Substack. by the way ladies and gentlemen dr k is a Substack. it's called tradition and sanity i will link in the description for this podcast so you can go sign up and this is what you write in bound by truth and then i'll pull up that document or that that uh, article you wrote and you said this is on page 11 in the second chapter you said no no text interprets itself every text requires an authoritative interpreter however the authoritative interpreter's interpretation is usually transmitted as a text this does not interpret itself, but requires an authoritative interpretation. And that text requires another. Thus is created the specter of an infinite regress in which no one can ever be certain that, that he possesses the correct meanings of the text. So I'll pull up that article real quick before you give your answer here, because I want to show people where they can go to get sort of some insight on this. And here is uh, your Tradition and Sanity Substack. It's called Vatican II is the Cause of Cultural Revolution, Questioning the Victim Narrative. And this is a good article. I recommend people will read it. But the reason I'm showing it is because there's this reluctance, even in, not all, not that often, but sometimes in tradition, to say, no, there might actually be things in Vatican II that actually kind of have caused the problem. And people get nervous mm-hmm. about the indefectibility of the church and all these things, which you address in your book. But I always say, hold on a second here. 
we don't need to prove, I mean, you can, I think, with religious liberty specifically, but we don't need to prove that there is a, an official doctrinal error that is explicit in the council documents because they don't exist in a vacuum. If there's ambiguity, that in and of itself is enough of an error, at least in milieu, to produce the chaos in the church. Can you comment on that for a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, here, here's the problem. The, the Second Vatican Council documents are enormous. It's a vast amount of, of verbiage, right? It's 16 documents. They're, some of them are quite lengthy. Um, and, you know, I, I like to tell people about this, right? There's a two volume set published by Georgetown University Press of all of the texts of the ecumenical councils of the Catholic Church, 21 of them. And they're both huge volumes. Mm -hmm. The first volume is the first uh, 18 councils. So from from Nicaea to um, uh, to right before Trent, whichever one that is. And then the second volume is just Trent, Vatican I, and Vatican II. Okay, mm -hmm. so that already tells you something about the, and, and within that volume, Trent is a pretty sizable amount, but Vatican II is most of it. Vatican I is quite short, actually, because it got cut short. Um, and so you have this ocean of text. Now, of course, in that ocean of text, as you said before, there are beautiful things, there are inspiring things, there are quite traditional sounding things for that matter. Right. I mean, this is what you're going to get when you have 2000 bishops and religious superiors throwing in their ideas all over the place. And when you have the central committee that's organizing the drafting, saying to themselves, we need to include some of this traditional material or nobody's going to vote for this document. Right. Um, but but the fact of the matter is Vatican II is a it's a, it's a minefield of open ended and ambiguous statements. That is things that can be twisted this way or that way. Um, you know, there's a, there's a medieval saying, authority is a wax nose. You can twist it this way or that way, right? And that's, and if you read the medieval philosophers and theologians, they're really clever at quoting Augustine to support whatever their position is. You know, they just find something in Augustine. So, I mean, this, you're never going to get around the possibility of pulling things out of context and misusing them or, or manipulating them or whatever. But the problem is in Vatican II, it reaches a new level because you've got a document on ecumenism, for example, red integratio, um, um, unitatis, unitatis red integratio, yep. that, that, that doesn't clearly say that all non-Catholic Christians need to convert to the Catholic Church and to the Catholic faith in order to secure their salvation, as Pius XII says in Mr. Two Corporis, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have that. Well, this is a big problem. I mean, and this is completely contrary to Pius XI in Mortalium Animos as well, right? You, right? you mentioned Dignitas Humanae. That's a really obvious case where, in spite of the document saying, this doesn't change traditional Catholic teaching, it goes on to say things that sound like exact contradictions of traditional Catholic teaching. Um, you have something like Lumen Gentium. Well, I, I wouldn't even go into Lumen Gentium. Let's say, um, Nostra Etate. That's this right. is my favorite example, right? Uh, Christians and Muslims w adore the same God, right? This is a sentence that Bishop Schneider often points to and says, that is actually erroneous. Why? Because the act of adoration is essentially different when you're looking at the infused virtue of faith that gives rise to supernatural adoration of the Trinity and the natural reason-based virtue of adoring the creator God that the Muslim has at, in the best case scenario, right? You're, it's like saying, it's like saying Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas adore the same God. Well, in a way, yes. And in a way, no, right? They, it, it's, there's a different sense of adoration. It's a pure equivocation there. So, the fact that a, an ecumenical council of the church can state something which is either erroneous or or confusingly equivocal, either of those things, is scandalous in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Because the purpose of a council as of a papal document is to bring clarity, not to bring confusion. Okay, uh, And so on that basis alone, we can say the Second Vatican Council um, introduced tremendous unrest and chaos into the church by acting contrary to the nature of the magisterium, which is to clarify and to um, to clarify and to condemn, right? <laughs> to, to clarify the truth and to condemn errors against the truth. Yeah, yeah. And just regarding the idea of worshiping the same God, I'll give Aristotle more of a pass than I will to the Muslims or the post-temple yes. Jews because yes. uh, Father Maudsley 
he has a video yes. on uh, on this on his YouTube channel. He's, he's a great wealth of knowledge on his channel. I love that channel. But he he goes through how on the Dome of the Rock, the inscription <laughs> the inscriptions are. I'm paraphrasing. The Christians are wrong. God is one. He's not three. And over and over again, the Trinity is false. Trinity. So with Aristotle, um, he is the blessed pagan in the sense that he is before yes. the revelation and therefore cannot yes. be culpable. Yes. And he doesn't reject it because it hasn't been revealed. So we can yes. say yes. we can say he worships the same God in the sense of he's the prime mover. He is the ultimate being yes. that is being itself. Whereas the Muslims, they reject that the way we conceive it. So we can't say it with them. Yes. No, you're right. And sorry, that was, thank you. I'm so glad you pointed that out because I am an Aristotelian and I don't want to dishonor the memory <laughs> of, of, the, of the philosopher, the one whom St. Thomas calls the philosopher. No, you're right. Aristotle is not rejecting the Trinity because he doesn't even know that it exists. That's right. But with, when, you, when you have Muhammad expressly rejecting the Trinity, this much you know as a certainty, as a certain conclusion, that he can only be worshiping the creator God. I, I disagree with people who say that the Muslims are worshiping a demon or something. I don't think that's true. I think they are, at least the best of the Muslims, are trying to worship the prime mover. They're trying to worship the creator God. But they explicitly say it's not the God of the Christians, so it must only be the God of the philosophers. And that's enough to say that it's already not the same act of worship or adoration, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the same act. Because our act of worshiping God is not a merely natural Re rationally inspired action like it would be for Aristotle, it is a supernaturally infused act of the virtue of faith, the theological virtue of faith. That's what we adore the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with. We adore God by the power of God himself. I mean, this is the amazing thing. We're not just philosophers. We are, we are sons of God, and God has introduced us into his own life so that we can adore him, you know, as the, as the angels and saints in heaven adore him, seeing him face to face. This is the gift of faith. And the Muslim doesn't have that gift of faith, so he cannot adore God in the same way in which we adore God. So that's that's just to clarify. No, yeah, you're right. So even, so even in Nostra Aetate, even if one can say there is some truth to what it says, it is not the full truth, and it is potentially actually factually, sort of rhyme there, it is potentially <laughs> factually incorrect and incomplete. And Christ tells us in the Apocalypse, I wish that you were hot or cold because lukewarm I will vomit out of my mouth. Uh, yeah, if it's not hot or, or cold, let your, let your yes, let, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Yeah, which is yeah. the rule that all the church councils followed before this. Yeah, before and this so tra traditionalists, there aren't many of them left, but for the traditionalists out there that uh, are intoxicated to an alarming degree with the hermeneutic continuity, listen, my friends, you don't have to prove. I think there is, but you don't have to prove there's explicit error in Vatican II to say that it's a bad council as far as councils go. You can say that without being a quote unquote arch traditionalist rad trad because it's just a matter of history. All right, we yes. are on, we are uh, we're going to talk for about two hours. Um, we do have a natural break right now, um, so I'm going to uh, end this first. Uh, don't worry, on your end, I won't actually change anything. We can just stay here. But for the viewer. I'm going to end this first episode because in the second episode of our series, I'll release this a couple days later. Um, I want to talk about the Sunday obligation. I want to talk about sacred music. I want to talk about the Roman rite, whether the Novus Ordo is even legitimate or not in the sense, and we'll explain that in the next one. And I think that's going to take up a lot of time. So I want to sort of end this first one here. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the first of two episodes of Dr. K. As always, let me know what you think in the comments, and I will see you in the next episode.